Soon, a new and hopefully temporary era may be upon us with restrictions as the watchword. I fully understand public concern, uh, your concern about the global spread of the virus, and it is highly likely that we will see a growing number of UK cases. And that's why keeping the country safe is the government's overriding priority. Boris Johnson, who faced criticism for a lackadaisical approach in the initial stages of the coronavirus crisis, has now taken full ownership of the UK's response. Uh, but um, I'll hand over to, uh, to our experts on, on that. Experts, once regarded with scepticism, were placed centre stage as the Prime Minister endorsed their central finding. In the likely event that the UK is unable to contain the virus, a series of emergency measures may be necessary. In the next phase, the authorities would seek to delay the onset of the virus by possibly closing schools, encouraging people to work from home and reducing the number of large-scale gatherings. Then a subsequent stage to mitigate its impact would kick in. This would see police concentrating on serious crime and maintaining public order in what is described as a stretching scenario up to one-fifth of the British workforce could be off work. Boris Johnson had assumed that the signature tunes of his premiership at this stage would be delivering Brexit and lending a helping hand to the left-behind communities which voted Conservative at the general election. Instead, out of a winter's sky comes a health crisis which will define this period and possibly his whole period in number 10. A former head of the civil service warns of potential disruption. I think we will see normal life change uh, and it will be quite rapid uh, and we will have to accommodate that. Uh, uh, and uh, we don't know when it will return back to where we are. Everybody, of course, hopes that we'll stop it at the, uh, at the contained stage, but you have to realistically see it getting to a, a, a different place. You have to hope for the best and plan for the worst. A Labour MP whose constituency was one of the first to suffer cases of coronavirus expects the public to be understanding. Actually, I don't think that this is outside of what people would expect in a situation like this. We might well have to change our personal behaviour. We might well have to change the way we interact with people. It might be as minor as not shaking hands with people. It might be as major as not travelling into your workplace, which you're used to doing day after day. But these are the things we have to consider in advance so that it is okay when it actually happens. If we lose control of this, we end up taking quite extreme measures, such as we've seen in parts of Italy and parts of Asia, where entire towns have to do uh, some pretty radical uh, you know, restrictions on movement, which I don't think is something that the British public would want to consider unless it was a real uh, last case resort. Spring is in the air. Soon, the mood may change as Britain adapts to an ominous challenge. Now, looming behind the human calculations and medical mitigations are underlying government concerns about what might happen to the economy. The markets have been on a roller coaster ride in recent days. Wall Street, for example, plunged last week, surged yesterday on the expectation of action, which, when it came today in the form of a half percent cut to interest rates, was followed by another drop. So what's going on? Our business editor, Helen Thomas, is here to make sense of it all, if indeed that's possible with the markets. Well, tell us about international economic uh, measures that, that have been taken today and, and if you could single out the really significant ones. Also, this is very obviously a, a global response to a global problem now. It's reminiscent of what we saw in the financial crisis with these world swings in markets. And then almost around the globe, you sort of see a succession of statements and action to try and reassure. So. You know, way back this morning, you saw the Australian central bank cut interest rates. Heard from Mark Carney this morning saying the bank would be prepared to cut interest rates here. You then had this coordinated statement from the G7 uh, central banks and finance ministers saying they would use all appropriate policy tools to protect the economy. That was felt to be a, a bit more sort of intent than action. But 
the, the really big move was the Federal Reserve in the US. Um, benchmark interest rates down by half a percentage point and um, they had the most room to cut they were expected to cut but they were obviously trying to go bigger than expected and earlier than expected it is the first time they've cut in between their regular scheduled meetings since the financial crisis and yet as you say u.s markets finished the day down three percent um I think we're going to be seeing more days like today. Uh, and of course, in some ways, uh, Western economies still haven't recovered since the financial crisis. Uh, the options are limited. So in the context of the UK uh, economy, what, what do you think are likely to be the effective ones? Well, so I think part of what you've seen from markets today is a signal that the central banks may not be the people that have the best tools for this. Um, when Mark Carney was talking about this type of the, the coronavirus's impact on the economy, he was talking about it as a disruption, not destruction, as we saw in the financial crisis. You know, they want to make sure that a temporary hit what should be a temporary hit to the economy doesn't become permanent because this, uh, people go out of business and so on. And, and the types of tools that central bankers have don't tend to be targeted enough. Um, they aren't best suited to this type of disruption. So disruption to supply chains, people being ill, not able to go to work, companies perhaps having to close for a while. In that scenario, the feeling is you really need to see governments stepping up with spending plans that can be really targeted. So it is really all eyes on the Treasury next week and the budget. Helen, thank you so much. Uh, today's action plan required a delicate political balancing act. Show the country that the government has a grip, but don't create a panic that could ultimately cause more disruption and economic damage than the virus itself. The chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance, was keen to emphasise that the timing with which any precautionary measures are implemented was all important in order to minimise disruption. There are a number of measures that could be taken to try and reduce the peak and flatten it a bit so we haven't got such a sharp number of people at any one time. And the question is at what time to implement which measures. If you do it too early, you end up with a lot of people having disruption, a lot of societal disruption, at a time you're not getting benefit. And you also ask a lot of people to go on for a long time doing this Whereas what we really want to do is to implement the, uh, whatever's necessary at the time, depending on how the ep epidemic goes, at the right time over a 12-week period or so is probably what's going to be needed to do it. So we don't want to go too early. So what kind of preparations may be needed to mitigate the impact of a major outbreak of the coronavirus in the UK? And do the government's plans hit the right note? Uh, we asked to speak to a government minister tonight. None was available. But here to shed some light on the preparations being made, we have the former chief economist at the Treasury, Richard Hughes, GP and health broadcaster, Sarah Jarvis, the SNP's Westminster Health spokesperson, Philippa Whitford, and the chair of Cambridge University's Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter. Welcome to you all. And I should say, in the interests of public health, all of them refused to shake my hand this <laughs> evening uh, when coming on set. Um, we're going to unpack the coronavirus, but can I just ask you quickly for a reaction uh, uh, to um, Nick's story, and in particular this idea that he was getting from a government source that dark forces were trying to unseat Pretty Patel, dark forces in the civil service, it was implied. Well, I think... Uh, you know, people should respect the civil service and the history of the civil service. They, they serve government after government. They are respected generally throughout politics. And I think if you are repeatedly getting a problem between a senior politician and different civil servants, this is three departments now, then I think you have to look at that you have a problem. The idea that the entire uh, UK civil service is up against one minister, regardless of department, I think it's a bit far-fetched. Right, let's uh, unpack the whole coronavirus thing and the action plan that we saw today. David, perhaps we could start with you. Do you think they've got the balance between giving people important and necessary information or potentially spreading fear right? I think they're doing pretty well. And it's a difficult balancing act between premature reassurance and alarmist headlines, because the media will jump on those immediately. Um, but I think that they have a real challenge of dealing with, with 
serious uncertainty, both about the disease itself and about what will happen, how people will react, and the effectiveness of the containment measures. It's not like a, a known risk like seasonal flu, which on average kills 6,000 people a year, but at least we, we've got a feeling for, for the size of the problem. So it, it means that there are epidemiologists behind him building models, making projections under all different scenarios, and some of those things will turn out rather well, and others, they'll turn out very badly. And I think what's unfortunate is that the only numbers that appear in the media are the what they call this reasonable worst case scenario, which led to headlines of half a million deaths last last week. Well, let's talk some numbers anyway, mm -hmm. which uh, I thought it was striking today when we got the figure of the number of people in the UK who'd been tested versus the number who was positive, and, and I reckon that to be 272 to 1. Now, does that indicate a very frightened population of people clearing out hand sanitizer from, from boots and all that sort of thing? Well, no, of course, what was happening initially was anybody who was considered at high risk was being tested. So initially, sort of oh, 10 days ago, the figure was closer to 2,000 to one. What we're seeing now is that because the original number was very, very small, that's gone from one to 50 in real terms, that's not a huge increase. But in relative terms, as a proportion, we haven't tested that many more people. What I think is more concerning is that just one of those cases was one who was tested by the screening system, which is going on among GPs. So 100 GPs are doing random screening among people who are coming in with flu-like symptoms. So just one of those has been found to have the coronavirus with no obvious risk. They haven't been abroad. They've got no obvious contact. That to me is perhaps the biggest concern, but I think we still can be very reassured that we are definitely slowing things down. And of course, if we can get past the winter period, that's going to make a big difference. Richard, I mean, just talking about the fear factor in markets, uh, I mean, is that just the way they behave or, or do you think people are really spooked in, in the financial sector by this? I think so far you've seen a significant reaction in the markets. I mean, share, share prices have been down I uh, had some of their worst weeks uh, since the global financial crisis. But I think when you look at uh, we, you know, what the impact is going to be on the real economy, we're not really going to know for a number of weeks until we get, until we get GDP figures. Uh, some of the key forecasters out there, like the IMF, the OECD, um, you know, they've had a much more measured reaction to what they think is going to be the impact on the outlook for the real economy. The OECD came out with some figures yesterday. They've downgraded their growth for the global GDP from 3% um, down to 25 now, they have a more severe scenario where growth goes all the way down to 1.5% of GDP, uh, whereas 1.5% growth for 2020, um, but that's nothing like the recession that we saw back in 2008 in response to the financial crisis. So, so far, the official forecasters are much, much more measured in their assessment of the situation um, than the financial markets. Well, let's, I mean, inevitably, people will look at some of the more uh, worst-case type uh, scenarios, and let's move on to whether the health service can actually cope. Uh, we heard some figures this morning in Hollywood from the Scottish government uh, estimating a, a rough number of people who might be infected and might need hospital care, 4% of the population. Now, we, we reckon that's about 170,000 people in Scotland with an A&E service that would normally look after 135,000. something. So it's a more than doubling, potentially, of the number of people who would need hospital care. How, how, how are you going to cope? Well, I think the question is going to be, what is the proportion that will actually need hospital care? Well, that's the 4%. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously what we still are not very clear about is what the actual denominator is. You know, we're aware of the really severe people. We've no idea of the mild. Uh, World Health Organization, we're obviously estimating 80% of people who are, have no other uh, comorbidity or not too old, it'll, it'll be like a flu. Obviously, we're, the, the whole point of the delay, and we're not in the delay phase, we're in the containment phase, but the whole point of the delay is to try and spread them out. You're not talking about that number in a week or a day, you're talking about that number across 2020. And therefore, yes, we don't have all of those beds at once, we don't have all of that space at once, but that's exactly the whole point of delay. And the problem is we're in the containment phase and we need to do as much as we can. And one of the issues I raised and came up repeatedly today is we will be asking people who are cases or contacts or who have traveled to self-isolate for two weeks. And one of the issues the government has to get right is the issue of sick pay. Many people are on working contracts with no sick pay. So if your employer is What's not going to give you anything, people are going to go to work. So the government needs to be willing to step in and say, well, actually, if this is worthwhile, that we help the employer 
cover sick pay for people on zero hours contracts or you know low but paid do, contracts. Sorry, do, on, on the question that uh, mm. Philip has just raised, uh, there's quite an important question of capacity, isn't there? Because if there's tens of thousands of people trying to ring their GP to say, I'm self-isolating, will you please give me a sick note? I mean, they're just not going to get through, are they? No, you're absolutely right. And of course, I think the government has said that really employers need to be sensible about this. The last thing I want is anybody to come in and see me Absolutely. because that's exactly what nobody should do if they think they have coronavirus. Do not go to GP, do not go to your pharmacy, you're only going to spread it. So what we're saying is, worst case scenario, people are going to ring up their GP, say, I've been told to self-isolate, the GP's going to take their word for it, they're going to issue a sick note. Well, they could do exactly the same thing to employers. So I think employers really do need to be sensible about this. GPs are going to have quite a lot to do in the next few months without issuing those certificates. Having said that, I do feel for employers, especially if you've got a small employer and everybody has to come into work, they can't work from home, it's going to be a challenge for them. So I agree that the government needs to think about it, perhaps universal credit, employment, support allowance, but of course maybe they're going to take too long. And if people aren't getting the money in time, they may be tempted not to self-isolate. I mean, universal Richard. credit takes five weeks to kick in, mm. so it's not going to help you in the fortnight. I mean, let's just push this forward one stage further even and assume that there is a, a fairly large scale effect on society. Big questions for the public finances potentially, aren't there? There was a mention in today's plan about delaying payment of tax, this kind of thing, assistance to people who might get into difficulty. But it, the government's almost going to have to spend its way out of this, isn't it? Um, well, so far, what we've heard mostly from is from central bankers. Um, but as, as your package alluded to, um, you know, there's only so much monetary policy you can do in these sorts of situations. Fiscal policy may need to step in um, if you have a, a significant impact on, on, re on output. Um, what we've seen so far from countries, Italy is the only major economy that's actually announced any sorts of fiscal measures. And those were about 3.6 billion euros, which is a relatively small share of Italy's GDP. It's about 0.2%. So a fairly modest package at the moment, very much focused on trying to deal with the immediate impact um, on, the, on the population affected. If you have a broader impact on demand, you do have to start thinking about other kinds of fiscal instruments, the kinds that can actually support the incomes of the most vulnerable, uh, uh, support consumption, help firms get over what ought to be a temporary impact on their turnover and a temporary impact on incomes, and one which will ultimately resolve itself in the longer term. David, uh, I just wonder in all of this, I mean, but, but particularly given what we've heard about in the economy, how important is confidence and how does the government try to maintain a sense of confidence when there are so many unknowns coming into the picture? I think, I think the crucial thing is to retain trust from what you say. And um, for example, if you look at what's happening in Iran, you know, people don't trust what the government statements and so it leads to wild rumours on social media and in other places. So they've got to keep got to keep that trust going by being open and honest about what's going on. Um, there was a lovely John Krebs, who was head of the Food Standards Agency, he had to deal with crisis after crisis. And he just said, you've got to tell people what you know, and then you have to say what you don't know. You have to be open about the uncertainty. You have to say what your plans are, what you can do for continuing contingencies, extreme contingencies, and then tell people what they can do, what actions they can take. But the crucial thing is say, things will change and we will come back to you. We will keep updating you. We've got to keep those messages going. They should be consistent messages, but they must be open and honest. And I want to come back to this idea that the, the, it's very unfortunate when the media just focus on these worst case scenarios. And you know, I know, you know this is going back to swine flu 2009, huge media attention to the worst case scenarios scenario then, which is from the current then CMO, 65,000 deaths. And in fact, there were 360 deaths. Now, I don't in any way say we'd be as fortunate in, in this outbreak, but we need to take into account that these are worst case scenarios, yep. scenarios and we should not get obsessed by them. I think that's absolutely right. I think if the government hadn't looked at the worst case scenario, they'd have been criticised. It's a bit like being a GP, really. If someone comes in with a cough, I will tell them I think it's extremely likely they've got a virus. There's a small chance they've got an allergy. It's just possible it could be asthma and I don't think it's cancer. What did they hear? Oh, I might have cancer. And actually, I think that we really are focusing on the worst case scenario. If we can spread this out so that not as many people, we've got a much better chance of allowing people to work from home. Children are not badly affected, which is great. Pregnant women aren't badly affected.